Uh, let me, sounds like it. <laughs> we welcome you all to the uh, Restoration Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We uh, pray you're having a very good morning, as are we here. The sun shines bright, weather's clear, a little crisp, but uh, that lets us know that we're very much alive. So at this time, I would like to offer a prayer and a prayer of invitation. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks for this gift of life and for the gift of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, Redeemer, and friend, and for your Holy Spirit, which dwells with us always. And Father, thank you. Thank you for our families, friends, and the relationships that you've led each of us to, because each of them mean so much in our life here on earth, this time of probation this time of learning to draw closer to you and love one another. So in this time, I ask a blessing upon our instructor this morning, Brother Steve Sickles, and I pray that um, his discernment for what you would give him would come forward and uh, he would be free of thy spirit. We pray these things and ask it in the blessed name of Jesus Christ in whom we trust. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, due to time, we cut off in a place that wasn't a natural stopping point last time. So I'm going to back up two verses from where we left off uh, to kind of make some continuity to this. To this, It's in Alma 19, beginning with verse 76. Alma 19, beginning with 76. And I hope you all do follow along um, as we go through these readings. And now behold is the meaning of the word restoration to take a thing of a natural state and place it in an unnatural state or to place it in a state opposite to its nature. Oh, my son, this is not the case, but the meaning of the word restoration is to bring back again evil for evil, or carnal for carnal, or devilish for devilish, good for that which is good, righteous for that which is righteous, justice for that which is just, merciful the, uh, for that which is merciful. <clears throat> Scriptures say elsewhere that uh, the spirit that we leave this life with is the spirit that we have in eternity. In other words, we'll be restored in eternity to what we were in this life. Therefore, my son, see that you are merciful unto your brethren. Deal justly, judge righteously, and do good continually. And if ye do all these things, then shall ye receive your reward. Yea, ye shall have mercy restored unto you again. Ye shall have justice restored unto you again. Ye shall have a righteous judgment restored unto you again. And ye shall have good rewarded to you again. For that which ye doth send out shall return unto you again and be restored. Therefore the word restoration more fully condemneth the sinner and justifieth him not at all. Yes, Woody. Uh, Brother Steve, I've got a reference to that in, in 1 John. Okay. Um, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that believeth him that begat loveth 
also, him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatever, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Did you say that it wound up with our faith, right? Is that what it said? Yes. Yes, with our faith. Uh, and that's the key to enduring to the end, is that faith, is maintaining that faith. Okay, uh, verse 81. And now, my son, I perceive there is somewhat more which doth worry your mind, which ye cannot understand, which is concerning the justice of God in the punishment of the sinner. For ye do try to suppose that it is injustice that the sinner should be consigned to a state of misery. Now behold, my son, I will explain this thing unto thee. For behold, after the Lord God sent our first parents forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken, yet he drove out the man and he placed at the east end of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the tree of life. Now we see that the man had become as God, knowing good and evil. And lest he should put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, that the Lord God placed cherubim in the flaming sword that he should not partake of the fruit. And thus we see that there was a time granted unto man to repent, yea, a probationary time, a time to repent and serve God. For behold, if Adam had put forth his hand immediately and partook of the tree of life, he would have lived forever according to the word of God, having no space for repentance. Yea, and also the word of God would have been void and the great plan of salvation would have been frustrated. Behold, it was appointed unto man to die. Therefore, as they were cut off from the tree of life, therefore they should be cut off from the face of the earth, and man became lost forever. Yea, they became fallen man. And now we see by this that our first parents were cut off, both temporally and spiritually, from the presence of the Lord. And thus we see they became subjects to follow after their own will. Is everybody with me on this so far? No, okay. Anybody doesn't have yet. Okay. Now behold, it was not expedient that man should be reclaimed from this temporal death, for that would destroy the great plan of happiness. Therefore, as the soul could never die, and the fall had brought upon all mankind a spiritual death as well as a temporal, that is, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord, therefore it is expedient that mankind should be reclaimed from the spiritual death. That's saying there that uh, the definition of spiritual death is being cut off from the presence of the Lord, in case anybody missed that. Spiritual death is being cut off from the presence of the Lord. Therefore, as they beca had become carnal, sensual, and devilish by nature, this probationary state became a state for them to prepare. It became a prob probationary state. And now remember, my son, if it were not for the plan of redemption, that is, laying it aside, as soon as they were dead, their souls were miserable being cut off from the presence of the Lord. And now there was no means to reclaim men from this fallen state, which man had brought upon himself because of his own disobedience. Therefore, according to justice, the plan of redemption could not be brought about, only on conditions of repentance of men 
in this probationary state. Yea, this probationary state, that is, during this life. For except it were for these conditions, mercy cannot take effect except it should destroy the work of justice. Now the work of justice could not be destroyed. If so, God would cease to be God. You see, justice is, justice is part of what God is. Mercy is part of what God is. Love is part of what God is. Long-suffering is part of what God is. If you take any part of that away, you're worshiping an idol. Most of the idols of men actually only focus on certain aspects of God, leaving other aspects out. We have gods of war, gods of harvest. All these various gods were created only focused on certain aspects of God, leaving out the rest. So we, the God we worship, we have to worship in his entirety. At some time or other, I, uh, you all have studied that because there's a chart out here in the hallway that lists all the characteristics of God. Probably wouldn't hurt to review that sometime. Now the work of justice, this is 95, verse 95 again. <clears throat> now the work of justice could not be destroyed. If so, God would cease to be God. And thus we see that all mankind were fallen, and they were in the grasp of justice. Yea, the justice of God, which consigned them forever to be cut off from his presence. And now the plan of mercy could not be brought about except an atonement should be made. Somebody had to pay the price. Therefore God himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice that God might be a perfect, just God and a merciful God also. Now repentance could not come unto men except there were a punishment, which also was as eternal as the life of the soul should be, affixed opposite to the plan of happiness, which was as eternal also as the life of the soul. Now how could a man repent except he should sin? How could he sin if there was no law? How could there be a law save there was a punishment? The, yeah, well. well, Steve, as we go down through this, I might as well use this. There's something that's got to be placed in the back of our minds. We've got to dig into our soul as we're reading about all these judgments and all these things. Because otherwise what happens is it's pretty easy to become depressed. It's pretty easy to turn around and feel like I don't have a chance. Yeah. You should be using the microphone so we can. <laughs> anyway, so I want to go to a, I want to go to a place where you quoted the star mentioned this morning. I want to go into the sixth chapter of Genesis. Yeah. For a minute, okay? I was going to get to that, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going to beat you to it. Okay. <laughs> I feel a need. Good. Okay. Good. So I'm going to start in 62. Even so, ye must be born again into the kingdom of heaven of water and of the spirit and be cleansed by blood, even the blood of mine only begotten son, that ye may be sanctified from all sin and enjoy the words of eternal life in this world and eternal life in the world to come, even immortal glory. For by the water ye keep the commandment, by the spirit ye are justified and by the blood ye are sanctified. Now here's your helper coming up to you, okay? Therefore it is given to abide in you the record of heaven. That's when we were spiritually born and created. That's the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thank you. The comforter, the Holy Ghost. 
and the peaceable things of immortal glory, the truth of all things, that which quickeneth all things, that which maketh alive all things, that which knoweth all things and hath all power according to wisdom, mercy, truth, justice, and judgment. And now, behold, I say unto you, this is the plan of salvation unto all men through the blood of mine only begotten. Amen. 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 It's just marvelous to me how we have this in the Book of Mormon and God restored it to the, to the Bible by revelation. That's not in the King James or any of the other uh, uh, records that have been that have made it down through history uh, into the various Bibles. It was restored by revelation, which should make it very important to us. Yes. Yeah. It is the temporal and physical, but I have spiritual and separate things. Right, right. Okay, I'm going to start over again at 98. <clears throat> now, repentance could not come unto men except there were a punishment, which also was as eternal as the life of the soul should be, affixed opposite to the plan of happiness which was as eternal also as the life of the soul. Now, how could a man repent except he should sin? How could he sin if there was no law? How could there be a law save there were a punishment? Now, there was a punishment affixed and a just law given which brought remorse of conscience unto men, unto man. Now, if there was no law given, if a man murdered, he should die. Would he be afraid he should die if he should murder? And also, if there was no law given against sin, men would not be afraid to sin. And if there was no law given if men sinned, what could justice do or mercy either? For they would have no claim upon the creature. But there is a law given and a punishment affixed and repentance granted, which repentance mercy claimeth otherwise justice claimeth the creature and executeth the law and the law inflicteth the punishment if not so the works of justice would be destroyed and god would cease to be god but god ceaseth not to be god and mercy claimeth the penitent and mercy cometh because of the atonement and the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of the dead bringeth back men into the presence of God. And thus they are restored into his presence to be judged according to their works, according to the law of justice. For behold, justice exerciseth all his demands, and also mercy claimeth all which is her own. And thus none but the truly penitent are saved. What? Now he's speaking to his son here who has committed a gross sin. 107. But this whole chapter is uh, addressed to his son. I uh, forgot what his name was. Corianton, yeah. Corianton. What? Do you suppose that mercy can rob justice? I say unto you, nay, not one whit. If so, God would cease to be God. And thus God bringeth about his great and eternal purposes, which were prepared from the foundation of the world. And thus cometh about the salvation and the redemption of men, and also their destruction and misery. Therefore, O my son, whosoever will come may come and partake of the waters of life freely. And whosoever will not come, the same is not compelled to come. But in the last day it shall be restored unto him according to his deeds. 
if he hath desired to do evil and hath not repented in his days, that is his probationary state, this life, behold, evil shall be done unto him according to the restoration of God. And now, my son, I desire that you should let these things trouble you no more. And only let your sins trouble you with that trouble which shall bring you down into repentance. O oh, my son, I desire that ye should deny the justice of God no more. Do not endeavor to excuse yourself in the least point because of your sins by denying the justice of God. But do you let the justice of God and his mercy and his long suffering? have full sway in your heart, but let it bring you down to the dust in humility, broken heart and contrite spirit. And now, O oh my son, ye are called of God to preach the word unto this people. And now, my son, go thy way, declare the word with truth and soberness that thou mayest bring souls unto repentance that the great plan of mercy may have claim upon them. You see, they were all, they were, uh, all of his brothers, Alma and all of his sons, were members of the Melchizedek priesthood to begin with. And may God grant unto you even according to my word, amen. Uh, verse 21, 2, um, Twenty-one two. Um, that's Alma twenty-one two. Therefore they gave thanks unto the Lord their God, yea, and they did fast much and pray much, and they did worship God with exceeding great joy. Hmm, that wasn't what I thought it was. Try verse thirty-four. Well, I got the wrong chapter. Anyway, these were some ev some proofs that uh, Corianton and his brothers and all of them were of the Melchizedek priesthood after the holy order of God <clears throat> or of the Son. Now, on this matter of uh, salvation, I want to turn to Luke uh, thirteen twenty four. Luke uh, thirteen twenty four. <clears throat> Strive to enter at the straight gate, for I say unto you, many shall seek to enter in, and shall not be able, for the Lord will not always strive with man. And First uh, Nephi uh, two twenty one. For behold, the Spirit of the Lord ceaseth, ceaseth soon to strive with them. <clears throat> now, uh, what that's referring to is the, the people in Jerusalem who the Lord uh, took Lehi and his family away from that... Uh, have rejected the word of God for so long, continued their idolatry and everything. And as the Lord is explaining to Lehi why he is leading them away from them is because, for behold, the spirit of the Lord ceaseth soon to strive with them. For behold, they have rejected the prophets and Jeremiah they cast into prison and they have sought to take away the life of my father insomuch that they have driven him out of the land. I'm going to make a point to this here pretty soon, but to go to 2 Nephi, 
2 Nephi 11. Second Nephi eleven seventy six and seventy seven. For because they yieldeth unto the devil, and choose works of darkness rather than light, therefore they must go down to hell. For the spirit of the Lord will not always strive with man, and when the spirit ceaseth to strive with man, then cometh speedy destruction, and this grieveth my soul. Now, Ether 141. Ether 141. And the Lord said unto him, I will forgive thee and thy brethren of their sins. But thou shalt not sin any more, for ye shall remember that my spirit will not always strive with man. Wherefore, if ye will sin until ye are fully ripe, ye shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And then DNC 1 5. DNC 1 5. Ephesians 1 5. Behold, I am God and have spoken it. These commandments are of me and were given unto me, given unto my servants in their weakness after the manner of their language that they might come to understanding. And inasmuch as they erred, it might be made known. And inasmuch as they sought wisdom, they might be instructed. And inasmuch as they sinned, they might be chastened that they might repent. And inasmuch as they were humble, they might be made strong and blessed from on high and receive knowledge from time to time. And after having received the record of the Nephites, yea, even my servant Joseph Smith Jr. might have power to translate through the mercy of God by the power of God, the Book of Mormon. And also those to whom these commandments were given might have power to lay the foundation of this church and to bring it forth out of obscurity and out of darkness the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth, with which I, the Lord, am well pleased, speaking unto the church collectively and not individually. For I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. And he that repents not from him shall be taken even the light which he has received. For my spirit shall not always strive with man, saith the Lord of hosts. I'm not judging anybody here present, because I know that we're all striving to endure to the end and be obedient to the commandments. But I bring this out, and there were many, many, many more scriptures. What's going on in the middle of the East today is because the Lord has ceased striving with them. What's going on in Ukraine and Russia? The Lord has ceased striving with them. What's going on in Mali? What's going on in Somalia? What's going on in Sudan? We are in that dark and cloudy day that the Lord has removed himself from their presence whereby they are reaping justice for their failure to respond to the uh, workings of the Holy Spirit. And um, we can't expect a lot of improvement in that until the Lord sends his servant to set the church in order and endow the priesthood to go forth, taking the gospel of those who remain. Well, we still have uh, 20 minutes, so if nobody has any comments on that, we'll go on to chapter 20. 
And now it came to pass that the sons of Alma did go forth among the people to declare the word unto them. And Alma also himself could not rest, and he also went. I might point out that Corianton did not lose his priesthood because of his sin. Now, because he repented, obviously, or he would have. Now we shall say no more concerning their preaching, except that they preached the word and the truth according to the spirit of prophecy and revelation. And they preached after the holy order of God by which they were called. That was the verse I was looking for in support of their priesthood. And now I return to an account of the wars between the Nephites and the Lamanites in the 18th year of the reign of Judges. Okay, that's 74 B.C., 74 years before Christ comes to, the, to Palestine. So there's only one generation left before the Lord returns. For behold, it came to pass that the Zoramites became Lamanites. Therefore, in the commencement of the 18th year, that would be about April, the people of the Nephites saw that the Lamanites were coming upon them. Therefore, they made preparations for war. Yea, they gathered together their armies in the land of Jershon. Now, the land of Jershon was by that time occupied by the converted Zoramites because the um, uh, anti-Nephi Lehi's had already uh, migrated to the land of Melek. They were only in the land of Jershon slightly more than a year. And it came to pass that the Lamanites came with their thousands, and they came into the land of Antionim, which was the land of the Zoramites, and a man by the name of Zarahemna was their leader. Now, that NAH on the end of Zarahim, Zarahimna, that may indicate that Zarahimna was a descendant of Zarahimla, who was a descendant of Mulek. And you'll find throughout the, uh, the Book of Mormon, these people wanting a king, trying to take over the, uh, the government. And from my studies of the Book of Mormon, I've come to the conclusion that these kingmen and others like the Zarahemna were likely of royal blood and wanted to restore the kingship of the house of David here in the new world. I'll point these uh, indications out as we as we go through the book. And incidentally, when people tried to overthrow their democracy down there, they were executed. Uh, verse 6, that's Alma 20, verse 6. And now as the Amalekites were of a more wicked and a murderous disposition than the Lamanites were in and of themselves, therefore Zarahemna appointed chief captains over the Lamanites, and they were all the Amalekites and the Zoramites. And this is another uh, evidence that once people have known the Lord and turn all together from him, they become completely subject to Satan. It would have been better for them had they never even known the truth. Now this he did that he might preserve their hatred towards the Nephites that he might bring them into subjection to the accomplishment of his desires. For behold, his designs were to stir up the Lamanites to anger against the Nephites. And this he did that he might usurp great power over them and also that he might gain power over the Nephites by bringing them into bondage, etc. And now the design of the Nephites was to support their lands and their houses and their wives and their children that they might preserve them from the hands of their enemies and also that they might preserve their rights and their privileges and also their liberty, that they might worship God according to their desires. For they knew that if they should fall into the hands of the Lamanites, that whosoever should worship God 
in spirit and in truth, the true and the living God, the Lamanites would destroy, which is Satan's purpose, to destroy the works of God. And the reason, the underlying reason, why they're wanting to preserve their rights, their privileges, their liberties, uh, their wives and their children, is because marriage is the foundation of raising up children unto God. And that can only happen in the kind of society that they had. One that worshiped God. Yea, they also knew the extreme hatred of the Lamanites towards their brethren, which were the people of Anti-Nephi-Lehi, which were called the people of Ammon. And they would not take up arms, yea, they had entered into a covenant, and they would not break it. Therefore, if they should fall into the hands of the Lamanites, they should be destroyed. This uh, is an illustration of how important covenant is. Covenant is not contract. Marriage is not contract. Our uh, entering into the waters of baptism is not a contract with Christ. It's a covenant. Covenant can only be broken by death. Covenant can only be broken by death. Now the, uh, the uh, Ammonites or the children of Ammon were... Uh, uh, moved to the land of Melech, and that's in uh, Alma 16, verse 254, if anybody's interested. Um, and like I say, they were only in the land of Jershon about a year, maybe slightly more. Uh, verse 13, And the Nephites would not suffer that they should be destroyed, that is, the Ammonites, Therefore they gave them lands for their inheritance. And the people of Ammon had given to the Nephites a large portion of their substance to support their armies. And thus the Nephites were compelled alone to stand against the Lamanites, which were a compound of Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael. And all those which had descended from the Nephites, which were Amalekites and Zoramites, and the descendants of the priests of Noah. It's hard, to, it's hard to go through this without bringing geography into it. The land that the Lord brought Lehi, uh, Lehi's family to was an extremely fertile land with a good climate because it was mountainous and it was volcanic and the valleys were filled with volcanic soil. Then, when because of uh, persecution, the Nephites had to flee into the lowlands, they went into a place that was more arid, more hot, uh, where there was ma uh, uh, water. There were many uh, uh, disease-carrying insects, especially mosquitoes. So the desire among those that had had enough of religion and enough of heat and enough of disease was to get back up into the mountains. I spent uh, July and half of August with uh, Frank Fye up in Oaxaca, Mexico, which is at 7,000 feet, the same altitude as Guatemala City. No insects. It was beautiful up there. You know, this is July and August. It would touch the low 80s for maybe an hour in the afternoon. At night, you slept under a blanket. You wore a sweater in the morning and the evening. Beautiful climate. So that was always drawing these people who were not committed enough to serving God, wanting to come back to the mountains. So they had many, many, many dissenters to the Lamanites. And it came, let's see, where did I leave off? Uh, okay, verse 16. Now those descendants were as numerous nearly as were the Nephites, and thus the Nephites were obliged to contend with their brethren 
even unto bloodshed. And it came to pass as the armies of the Lamanites had gathered together in the land of Antionum. Behold, the armies of the Nephites were prepared to meet them in the land of Jershon. Now the leader of the Nephites, or the man which had been appointed to be the chief captain over the Nephites, now the chief captain took command of all the armies of the Nephites, and his name was Moroni. And Moroni took all the command and the governments of their wars. And he was only 20 and five years old when he was appointed chief commander over the armies of the Nephites. Uh, he was born, uh, this is in the margins of the uh, covenant edition of the Book of Mormon, so I'll give it to you. <clears throat> he, was born, uh, he was born in 99 B.C., and he died in 56 B.C., making him only 43 years old at his death. And it came to pass that he met the Lamanites in the borders of Jershon. And his people were armed with swords and with cemeteries and all manner of weapons of war. And it came to pass that when the armies of the Lamanites saw that the people of Nephi, or that Moroni, had prepared his people with breastplates and with arm shields, yea, and also shields to defend their heads, and also they were dressed with thick clothing, now the army of Zarahemna was not prepared with any such thing. They had only their swords and their scimitars, their bows and their arrows, their stones and their slings, but they were naked, save it were a skin, which was girded about their loins. Yea, all were naked, save it were the Zoramites and the Malachites. And I, point out, I might point out that up here in 21, where it says the Nephites, uh, also they were dressed with thick clothing, uh, when the Spanish invaded, uh, they discovered that the uh, Indian warriors wore thick woolen uh, jackets or coats that had been soaked in seawater and dried. And many of the Spanish even adopted that form of armor as being superior to their metal armor because of its resistance to penetration and yet being more comfortable. Now verse 25. Behold, now it came to pass that they durst not come against the Nephites in the borders of Jershon. Therefore they departed out of the land of Antionum into the wilderness and took their journey round about in the wilderness away by the head of the river Sidon that they might come into the land of Manti and take possession of the land. For they did not suppose that the armies of Moroni would know whither they had gone. But it came to pass, as soon as they had departed into the wilderness, Moroni sent spies into the wilderness to watch their camp. And Moroni also, knowing of the prophecies of Alma, sent certain men unto him, desiring him that he should inquire of the Lord whether the armies of the Nephites should go to defend themselves against the Lamanites. And it came to pass that the word of the Lord came unto Alma. And Alma informed the messengers of Moroni that the armies of the Lamanites were marching round about in the wilderness, that they might come over into the land of Manti, that they might commence an attack upon the more weak part of the people. And those messengers went and delivered the message to Moroni. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we had prophets conducting our military endeavors. <laughs> now, Moroni now Moroni, leaving a part of his army in the land of Jershon, lest by any means a part of the Lamanites should come into that land and take possession of the city. And Moroni took the remainder part of his army and marched over into the land of Manti. And he caused that all the people in that quarter of the land should gather themselves together to battle against the Lamanites to defend their lands and their country, their rights and their liberties. Therefore, they were prepared against the time of the coming of the Lamanites. And it came to pass that Moroni caused that his army should be secreted in the valley which was near the bank of the river Sidon, 
which was on the west of the river Sidon in the wilderness. And Moroni placed spies round about that he might know when the camp of the Lamanites should come. Uh, if anybody, I can explain where these places are to anybody who's interested privately since we're not going to do geography in the class. And now as Moroni knew the intention of the Lamanites, that it was their intention to destroy their brethren or to subject them and bring them into bondage, that they might establish a kingdom unto themselves over all the land. There's another evidence that Zarahemna may have been a descendant of Mulek or of the house of David. And I lost my place. Oh, here we go. Verse 33. And now as Moroni knew the intention of the Lamanites, that it was their intention to destroy their brethren or to subject them and bring them into bondage, that they might establish a kingdom unto themselves over all the land. And he also knowing that it was the only desire of the Nephites to preserve their lands and their liberty and their church. Therefore he thought it no sin that he should defend them by stratagem. Therefore he found by his spies which course the Lamanites were to take. Therefore he divided his army and brought a part over into the valley and concealed them on the east and on the south of the hill Ripla. And the remainder he concealed in the west valley on the west of the river Sidon and so down into the borders of the land Manti. Now we also know that the, the city of Zarahemla was on the rest of the river Sidon too. So this would have been uh, south of the river Sidon. And now having placed his army according to his desire, he was prepared to meet them. And it came to pass that the Lamanites came up on the north of the hill where a part of the army of Moroni was concealed. And it came to pass that as the Lamanites had passed the hill Ripla and came into the valley and began to cross the river Sidon, the army which was concealed on the south of the hill, who was led by a man whose name was Lehi, and he led his army forth and encircled the Lamanites about on the east and in their rear. And it came to pass that the Lamanites, when they saw the Nephites coming upon them in their rear, turned them about and began to contend with the army of Lehi. And the work of death commenced on both sides. But it was more dreadful on the part of the Lamanites, for their nakedness was exposed to the heavy blows of the Nephites with their swords and their scimitars, which brought death almost at every stroke. While on the other hand, there was now and then a man fell among the Nephites by their wounds and the loss of blood. They being, they being shielded from the more vital parts of the body or the more vital parts of the body being shielded from the strokes of the Lamanites by their blessed plates and their arm plates, arm shields and their head plates. And thus the Nephites did carry on the work of death among the Lamanites. Now, this goes on and on with this battle back and forth. And uh, I don't think it's necessary that we go through all the details of this um, of this uh, ba great battle. Um, the Zoramites, of course, kept driving the Nephi, the, the uh, Lamanites on. And we drop down to verse 50. It says, Nevertheless, the Nephites were inspired by a better cause, for they were not fighting for monarchy nor power, but they were fighting for their homes and their liberty, liberties their wives and their childrens and their all, yea, for the rites of worship and their church. And they were doing that which they felt was the duty which they owed to their God. For the Lord had said unto them and also unto their fathers, that inasmuch as ye are not guilty of the first offense or the second, ye shall not suffer yourselves to be slain by the hands of your enemies. Now that also comes from the Mosaic law that uh, you're required to uh, turn the cheek 
once, twice, if they come against you the third time, then you're uh, justified in, uh, in responding against your enemies. Yeah. I'm going to read to you a verse from a song. Okay. Oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand between their loved homes and a war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may this heaven rescued land praise the power that has made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, I think after verse 52 here, we're going to call it a, a morning. And again the Lord has said that, Ye shall defend your families even unto bloodshed. Therefore this cause were the Nephites contending with the Lamanites to defend themselves and their families and their lands, their country and their rights and their religion. Thank you for your attention and uh, we'll take a break before the uh, 11 o'clock service.